you know, uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates has a brilliant assessment of the problem. OK, the issue is that he doesn't have a real solution. OK, right. uh, uh, what he would ultimately say is, is, is the meaning is in the struggle, you know, and, and that's what that's what Anthony Penn would say. I mean, you know, ultimately we struggle for struggle's sake. Right. Mm. And um, and so, you know, the, the problem with that is that um, our identity as a people is then fundamentally rooted and grounded in our own oppression. Mm. Right. <laughs> our, we don't have meaning beyond oppression. Right. If uh, if if that is the case, you know, um, and so we've got to have an eschatology. We've got to have a hope that goes beyond this world and the hope that goes beyond this world uh, does not make us acquiescent. It actually claims our actions it, uh, today. It actually impels us and, and actually strengthens us to continue engaging, looking, looking towards something and looking forward uh, to something. Um, that's beyond just this day, right? So we're <laughs>
That's a great question, man. Uh, you know, I would say if I were to summarize uh, the legacy of Dr. King, which is such a, an amazing legacy, it's almost sort of like saying, well, what's the legacy of John Calvin or what's the legacy of, of, uh, of Karl Barth or what's the legacy? Of, you know, this is, we're talking about something huge here. What's the legacy of Martin Luther? You know, uh, yeah. I would say uh, his greatest legacy is the legacy of love mm -hmm. and the, uh, the social um, ap appropriation of the demand of love. Um, actually, I would say the cross center, cross centered, gospel grounded demand of love, and what that looks like when it's applied uh, in the social sphere. So, uh, so, so that's that's really his great legacy. Um, yeah. And uh, and and King thought of himself as uh, as a theologian. He got his uh, his his doctorate in systematic theology from Boston University. And most yeah. people, when they think of King, they think of you know. Uh, maybe like an ethicist or, you know, just a social icon or an activist. And certainly he was he was an activist, uh, but he thought of himself first and foremost as a, as a pastor and the, a pastor theologian. And so everything he did was deeply theological and deeply biblical. And mm -hmm. so uh, he's got to be understood in that light. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I think that's a, a point that is often missed as well when you talk about the legacy of uh, Dr. King, that he was a Baptist preacher, uh, like you said, a systematic theologian. Um, a lot of his quotes and his speeches are drawing upon biblical imagery of justice. Um, for the for the Christian that struggles or might, might be ignorant of this, what's the biblical precedent for racial reconciliation or even pursuing justice in the church? If you have a, a person who's coming and saying, you know, to you, um, Dr. Edmondson, you know, the church shouldn't be concerned with these things, from the Bible, from the text, what are some some ways that we would approach that um, objection or obstacle? That's a great question. Uh, well, I think it uh, it, it really uh, goes right back to the beginning, right back to Genesis. Uh, you can look at, uh, for instance, uh, Genesis uh, chapter three, uh, which is really the first uh, announcement uh, of the gospel, this proto gospel, that, which is announced right after um, right after the fall of humanity and the Lord announces this coming seed who will crush the head of the serpent, uh, thereby making right all that the serpent had made wrong. And uh, what that what that uh, really what that ultimately means uh, becomes more clear throughout the pages of Scripture. So as as redemptive history goes forward, as 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 God's revelation begins to progress, we begin to see um, the outworkings of sin. And the way in which the promised uh, Messiah and the promised salvation will actually turn back um, e the evil sin and death that had been unleashed uh, through um, uh, through through uh, humanity's disobedience. So mm -hmm. um, so so part of that curse and part of that fall, part of the sin and uh, miser misery situation that came through sin was uh, a situation in which humanity turned on itself. Uh, uh, in, uh, in, in fear and in anger and in hatred, humanity begins to turn on itself. Uh, we see the first uh, fruits of that when, uh, when Cain killed his brother Abel. Uh, he denies the responsibility of being his brother's keeper. And, and that, uh, that kind of fundamental sentiment, um, that fundamental heart confession of am I my brother's keeper, uh, is really at the heart of, of, of racialized sin in our world. And so that that begins to to continue to to go forward, and you know, and and I mean, I don't need to rehearse the entire history. I mean, it's a it's a tragic and brutal history uh, of uh, of people, uh, you know, turning on each other, hating each other, killing each other, exploiting each other, and and yet um, God's promise that this seed, this coming seed, will undo these things uh, remained until finally um, um, that seed came and we know that person is Jesus Christ. And um, when he came, he actually, um, he exemplified what it would mean to actually turn back this situation of, of sin and alienation, not only alienation from God, but alienation from one another and enmity toward one another. Now, one of the, one of the, uh, one of the ways in which we see the racial system being addressed or uh, ethnic strife being addressed is um, not only through Jesus's interactions with the Gentiles. You know, you keep in mind that the Messiah who came uh, actually spent a good portion of his life in Egypt, which was a which was, in you know, for um, for a Jew, that would be in some ways scandalous. Right. To have your Messiah sort of growing up in Egypt. Right. Uh, given the history of. 
of God's people with the Egyptians. Uh, yet God allowed his, uh, his son to grow up in Egypt and come back and then uh, to live in Galilee of the Gentiles. Right. And so he's growing. So he's living amongst the Gentiles. He's he's interacting uh, with them. And when he comes down and, and he opens up his public ministry uh, and then when he makes his appearance uh, uh, to actually uh, you know, cleanse the temple, one of the things he does uh, is he actually restores God's house as a house of prayer for all people. OK, now that was a huge deal because at that time um, the temple had become uh, a race based uh, kind of a race based. Uh, it was it was a system of race based injustice where the Jews had allowed themselves to uh, had, had sort of sectioned off certain parts of the temple for them to pray. And it can and it sort of guarded that part of the temple in order to uh, it guarded the sanctity of that and and kept it nice and quiet. But they allowed the part in which the Gentiles to, could pray to become uh, a livestock exchange. And they uh, and, and, and so there, it was noisy. It was smelly. It was uh, it was not the kind of environment that you would want to have to be praying in. And when the Lord comes and he sees this situation, he is incensed by this kind of um, racialized injustice and systematized injustice. And when the Lord cleanses the temple, he actually is overturning uh, race based, systematized injustice uh, right there at the cleansing of the temple. And so if someone said, well, you know, what is, what is the church? Have? I mean, why should the church care about this? Uh, why should the church be involved in this? I would simply say we need to follow our Lord in also seeking to overturn race-based institutionalized injustice. Um, Jesus set the precedent. Um, he has come to destroy the works of the devil. This is part of the works of the devil. And right there at the cleansing of the temple, we see uh, him, him doing that. So, Wow. Uh, that, that's powerful. I hope uh, you know our viewers are encouraged and challenged by that. Um, just seeing from the biblical text in another way and how Jesus actually engaged um, in uh racial reconciliation and uh, uh, actually oppose systemic injustice. Um, uh, Dr. Edmondson, I, you're not just a theologian and scholar, you're also a pastor. Mm -hmm. um, and so from a, a pastoral perspective, a question I get all the time um, from white evangelicals or people even in a particular church planning context or just amongst members mm -hmm. um, is how can Christians or churches engage during this MLK holiday? Um, mm. What should they be thinking about? How should they think about engaging? You know, um, of course, that we shouldn't make this a seasonal thing to talk about racial reconciliation and systemic injustice. But right. there seems to be a current in our culture that makes it for a good time for people to start thinking. Um, you know, you, you know, the black church has a rich history of engaging this from, uh, I mean, uh, coloring books of MLK and kids right. ministry. Uh, every uh, church have an MLK on on the church fan, um, right. or uh, not only that, but just the rich history of the connection um, of even some of our homiletical hero heroes like Gardner C. Taylor, uh, right. who was uh, a preacher of God's word, but also engaged and a partner with MLK in a lot of ways. Um, mm -hmm. How should Christians and churches um, try to engage um, this legacy or even this holiday? That's a great question. I would I would say first and foremost, um, uh, ask the Lord to help you understand. Um, what has what the gospel has to do with uh, with social justice um, and the pursuit of justice in the world? Uh, because if you if you if you if you, if a Christian um, approaches these things outside of their faith or or as an aside to the faith or as a kind of a something that they sort of do as a, just a kind of a side thing, then they won't really have the fortitude and the faith and the hope to continue on in this work. Um, if you if you don't understand that this is something that Christ has called us to and that gives us and, and Christ gives us the resources to pursue it, then um, it, it won't you you you'll never really sacrifice for it. You know, you'll only be in insofar as it benefits you personally and you won't really give yourself to it fully. So I would say uh, Christians have got to uh, dig into uh, to the scriptures and in particularly into resources that help illuminate what the scriptures and God's word and the gospel has to say to issues of social justice. Mm -hmm. um, what I tell, uh, what I tell uh, the, uh, the saints at New City Fellowship, uh, the church I serve, I say, look, remember your baptism, remember your baptism. And, and that might seem odd to some people to say, well, what do you mean by remember your baptism? But you know, baptism uh, really signifies uh, our union with Christ, 
uh, in his death, burial and resurrection, but also our union with one another. Mm -hmm. And so it calls. And so everyone that is joined to Jesus by faith is also joined to everybody else that Jesus is joined to. Uh, every person of every tribe and nation and tongue. And that kind of union is a really powerful thing because it gives it calls us to a kind of practical responsibility to people that don't look like us, to people that might not be in the same socioeconomic place that we're in. And when I say remember your baptism, you can't just remember it when we come together on Sunday morning. You've got to remember your baptism in the voting booth. You've got to remember when you go in the voting booth to pull that lever that you're joined to people uh, to that 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 are uh, people that are baptized in Christ down in Mexico, people that are baptized in Christ in Haiti, people that are baptized in Christ in all the countries of Africa, people that are baptized in Christ on the other side of the tracks. And you can't forget them when you go into the voting booth. You can't forget them as you spend your money. You can't forget them as you think politically. Remember your baptism. So that's what I tell people. Oh, that's good. That's really good. Um, in terms of your uh, your interest with this, um, it turned into a dissertation in a book. Yeah. Um, could you tell us the title of the book and um, kind of what brought you about to studying this further? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so the power, the name of the book is "The Power of Unearned Suffering," um, and uh, it is uh, it's it's about the roots and implications of MLK's redemptive suffering theodicy. Now I know that's a a mouthful. Um, <laughs> well, the roots of in, the roots and implications of MLK's redemptive suffering theodicy. So, I, so the beginning of the book, I really look at the roots of King's approach to the problem of evil. Uh, the problem of evil is really uh, the 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 very long-standing tension between God's goodness, God's power, and the uh, the the evident suffering that we see in our world. Right? God is good, so we know that God would not uh, want us to. To suffer, right? God is powerful. God is able to prevent and intervene in our suffering if God uh, so will. Uh, so why is it that we suffer? You know, how do we how do we reconcile these things? And 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 the answers to that that sort of tension is a classic problem of evil. And uh, and and black folk have been dealing with this issue uh, ever since uh, we've arrived at, on these shores. Ever since ever since we've been found ourselves in the in the belly of slave ships, we we've, we've had to grapple with the question of uh, how how and why would a good and powerful God allow me to be in this situation? And so uh, and so, you know, uh, we have a, a, a actually a 250 mm -hmm. uh, year plus old tradition of, of grappling with this question. This is the, the question of problem of evil question. Of theodicy is, is considered to be the one of the toughest questions in all of theology. And, uh, and, and black folk uh, uh, historically uh, enslaved people without the benefit of formal theological education uh, and the benefit of all the other kinds of uh, 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 formal resources that other people had wrestled deeply with the hardest questions and the hardest contradictions of life and came out with some amazing responses. Mm -hmm. um, a redemptive suffering theodicy uh, really affirms that God is able to bring about God's good purposes uh, through faithful engagement with suffering, faithful mm. engagement with suffering, that uh, that ultimately uh, evil, sin, and death, and suffering does not have the final say, uh, but that God's grace and God's uh, uh, promises and God's victory have the final say in our situation. Mm. And so uh, that's the kind of faith that carried, um, uh, you know, the black church and black Christians. Uh, through 250 years of slavery, uh, through uh, through Jim Crow, uh, through the lynching tree, through segregation, uh, and it continues to carry uh, uh, many uh, Christians of color through all kinds of uh, suffering situations. That's great. Um, you know, I think that's an important, like such an important um, aspect to study and, and research and kind of engage. Uh, Ju3 Project has a mission to, uh, of course, create resources um, for um, apologetics, defending the faith um, in the African-American context, um, not merely just African-American, but black and brown context, uh, cultural apologetics as an endeavor. Um, what some of our um, opposition might say is, you know, Christianity is the lay down and stay down religion um, that actually it, it creates a, a passivity towards um, evil and injustice. And it's uh, been the white man's religion and it's pacified us. 
Um, right. And then even from like an academic standpoint, and when, mm -hmm. one of the characters I, uh, I see in your book, and I would love for you to talk about just his um, influence, his valid points, and then also maybe critique him, um, is Anthony B. Penn. And, yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know him. I think he's a, a figure that we should be aware of. Absolutely. Um, and a lot of he is, um, you know, I would say uh, one of the up and coming uh, scholars that we would know um, all of his works is, is in terms of a Michael Eric Dyson or Cornell West. Right. Um, he's using a lot of the religious research in terms of African American. Um, but the the backside of that is he's a humanist. Um, he's the atheist. He doesn't believe in God. And he also begins to heavily cr critique um, uh, Christian theology, specifically liberation theology. Right. And his believes that a theodicy or a solution to the problem of evil is, uh, you know, more significant if we perhaps do away with God um, and right. kind of he thinks of justice for African-Americans, um, not only merely just post civil rights, but also um, post church engagement. Right, um, right. Does that right. look so? Tell us, uh, you know, kind of just some of his valid points. Yeah. Um, because he, he has a, a strong assessment of some um, uh, huge issues, but also mm -hmm. you wouldn't mind just critiquing some of his solutions. Okay, that's a great question, brother. So here's the interesting thing. So the fascinating thing is that, uh, you know, so uh, Lexington, Lexington uh, Press, which is the, pub, the, the publisher of my book. Uh, has a has a religion and race series, and they considered my religion my book being the first, the inaugural volume in their religion and race series. Now, the series editor uh, is Anthony Penn, right? And so when they told me that, when they told me, you know, I had already <laughs> written the dissertation, they said we want you to consider submitting your manuscript to be the inaugural volume, and the editor, the series editor is Anthony Penn. Okay. Yeah. And uh, and I thought, you know, I thought long and hard about that. Do I want to submit my manuscript to edit to, to Dr. Penn to, to be edited? You know, because he uh, he's kind of the, the uh, he, he's kind of the chief antagonist in my uh, in, in my work here, yeah. uh, as it were. And uh, and I but I, went, I decided to allow him to do that. And part of the reason is was because I wanted to make sure that I had an accurate and fair assessment of his views. I wanted him to be able to look at look at the book mm -hmm. and recognize himself himself in the book. And uh and if 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 he looked at my work and he said, hey look, you know, this is not really what I'm saying, uh then I knew I had missed it. But if I were able if I was able to submit it to him and he looks at it and he says, hey look, well yeah, I think this accurately represents me and I think you actually have cogent points uh in this debate against me uh then i i you know that, that makes me feel good i want to have a charitable assessment of folks that i'm arguing with so um so that's that's, that's a little bit of backstory right so anthony mm -hmm. penn is an atheistic humanist um he uh he wrote a book uh called why lord which actually chronicles redemptive the uh, the the black redemptive suffering the odyssey um uh tradition and he argues very strongly against it uh, as you mentioned, he believes that uh, that that theism uh, in general uh, induces a kind of social acquiescence. If we are uh, waiting on God to do something for us, then we will not do anything for ourselves. And I think and that's sort of his basic uh, his his basic objection uh, to theism and particularly redemptive suffering um, theodicies. I mean, he feels like that this kind of thing inculcates a kind of a uh, a dangerous martyr mentality, hmm. and uh, it it sort of glorifies violence in a certain kind of way, and so uh, and so he he looks at King as one example of a of a redemptive suffering theodicy that he you know argues very strongly against and thinks again that it induces uh, social acquiescence. Now, what I do is I I, I basically say, well, let's let's look at that historically. Okay, we can look at that the, uh, theologically, and we can, and I, I, I would, I'm going to get to that as well. But I think, you know, let's look at this historically. Uh, when we look at uh, the civil rights movement, okay, we are looking at a movement that was founded upon the, uh, up, upon, it was grounded in the church, it was grounded in the faith of the church, it was empowered by the faith of the church, and it was steered by the theology. Uh, of the church, and not just that, a theology rooted and grounded in the cross of Christ, a uh, theology that said that uh, because of the of the engagement that Christ showed us and the example that He showed us uh, when He um, when He when He 
uh, engaged his suffering, when he engaged in justice that came his way in the Garden of Gethsemane and going to the cross, uh, we can see um, uh, how to engage our suffering and we can be given confidence that, uh, that the Lord will work in and through our engagement with suffering toward a redemptive outcome, toward an outcome that will, uh, that will liberate not only ourselves, but also, uh, also, also others, and even, even the oppressor themselves. And so, um, so, so that was a powerful thing. And and that was behind, that that nonviolence, that that engaged, that redemptive suffering, that redemptive engagement with suffering, really stood behind the civil rights movement. Uh, agopic engagement, loving engagement, self sacrificial engagement with suffering. Now I look historically, and I say, hey, look. Um, um, you know, that kind of belief, historically speaking, has not induced acquiescence. It's actually propelled activism and it sustained uh, young people who put themselves in harm's way for our freedoms. It didn't cause them to decide to shrink back and go home in the face of Bull Connor's fire hoses and attack dogs. Rather, it, it actually impelled them, it encouraged them and strengthened them to continue fighting on. Right. And so, so historically speaking, uh, that case doesn't hold water. Uh, 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 it doesn't induce acquiescence. Now, theologically speaking, it doesn't, it doesn't either. A great mistake that, uh, that people think of when they think of King's theology and his theodicy is they think that what King is saying is that suffering itself is a good. But he's not saying that. Uh, what King and what others uh, throughout uh, uh, you know Black history that have held to this theodicy uh, uh, are, are saying is that engagement with the suffering that already exists can be a good, right? When we do it faithfully, and there are different ways to engage suffering. When in in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, when Christ um, was encount encountered suffering, there were different responses to it. Um, Peter. He engaged suffering with violence. Uh, when he saw the mob coming to arrest Christ, he drew his sword and he met he met violence with violence. And um, and then there was there were other uh, uh, there were other forms of, of response. Uh, the, the disciples, uh, uh, they all fled. They, they, they acquiesced. They ran away. They refused to engage. But Jesus actually shows another way. He shows a third way. Not violent, not violent retaliation, not passive acquiescence, but actually nonviolent direct action. There's a way to actually engage our suffering uh, to the glory of God, to do it directly, to do it lovingly, um, and 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 to do it with courage and faith and conviction, but to do it nonviolently, um, seeking for the 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 redemption and the rec and the reconciliation and and uh, and the blessing of uh of of god's people so um so 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 jesus shows us a third way and so king king got hold of this revelation and king was gripped by it and king realized that this was the only way that black people are going to move forward that if we took up arms against if, if black folk if oppressed people had taken up arms in our situation against the oppressor that um that they had more guns than we did Mm. Right. <laughs> they have the tanks. And and uh, he said, look, this is not going to this is just not going to work. If we do with the mill, if we do what Malcolm X is telling us to do and we pick up arms and, and, and try to fight our way through this uh, uh, violently, that is only going to lead to more violence, that um, the powers and principalities that we're actually warring against are going to win if we respond in a sinful, violent way. And it's not gonna, and it's just a matter of numbers. We they got more guns than we got, right? And, uh, we're and we're not gonna not gonna win. So we can't respond that way, um, and 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 we can't respond through acquiescence. So we've got to do it through nonviolent direct action. That's great. And I just encourage our our listeners, our viewers, to uh, really just continue to consider. <laughs> Answer these questions because uh, the truth is a lot of violence towards. Or black and brown bodies, and brown bodies still in America, um, and what we would see in a lot of countries, um, what we would see in the Black Lives Matter, Matter, or even um, some of the people, some of the people that are um, 
unorthodox uh, streams of Christianity. A lot of times, these are all struggling with the problem with the um, answer. And I think, absolutely, yeah, I think it's huge to look at MLK his his orthodox um, way of uh, using redemptive suffering, having this theodicy. I think it's just huge for our day, especially with millennials who are uh, in a lot of ways disconnected from the local church or the streams of um, the black church as an institution theologically or historically. It's huge for us to mm -hmm. engage and to um, recapitulate a lot of these arguments in history. Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. There's, there's, no there's no doubt about it. I mean, I'll um, say, say this. I, I think this is important to say. Um, the humanists, black humanists like Penn, and even I think more popular, ta Coates. Coates. Uh, I, you know, as as people sort of engage with Coates and he's uh, he's a, you know, a brilliant and, and insightful and wonderful writer. He's really popularizing um, a lot of the theology that you find in Anthony Penn, you know, mm -hmm. this kind of atheistic humanist approach to uh, to to evil and to the struggle. Um, and, um, and 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 oftentimes it must be said that oftentimes these kind of, the, the, you know, um, Oftentimes, unbelievers uh, can still give you an accurate assessment of the problem. Yes. Right. And we've got to be willing to admit that. We've got to be willing to admit, hey, look, you know, um, you know, uh, Ta Nehisi Coates has a brilliant assessment of the problem. Okay. Yeah. The issue is that he doesn't have a real solution. Okay. Right. Uh, uh, what he would ultimately say is, is, is the meaning is in the struggle, you know, and, and that's what, that's what Anthony Penn would say. I mean, you know, ultimately we struggle for struggle's sake. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, you know, the, the problem with that is that um, our identity as a people is then fundamentally rooted and grounded in our own oppression. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> our, we don't have meaning beyond oppression. Right. If uh, right. if if that is the case, you know, um, and so we've got to have an eschatology. We've got to have a hope that goes beyond this world and the hope that goes beyond this world uh, does not make us acquiescent. It actually claims our actions it, uh, today. It actually impels us and, and actually strengthens us to continue engaging, looking, looking towards something and looking forward uh, to something um, that's beyond just this day. Right. So we're we're. We're pilgrims and we recognize that. The thing about being a pilgrim is that your your actions today are are taken in light of your destination tomorrow. And right. so it doesn't your destination tomorrow doesn't make you acquiesce and doesn't make you stop stop engaging, but it keeps you engaging. Mm. No, that's 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 a great point. That's a uh, man, I, I just feel like that's pivotal um, to see that, you know, we don't merely have an identity as victims. Um, right. And then we Specifically, we're more than conquerors through Christ. Um, Absolutely. Man, to continue the study for our listeners who are uh, engaged, intrigued now to kind of see this from MLK, to see this even answer from um, historic Christianity on the problem of evil, what we kind of call the Odyssey, um, a defense of God. What resources would you recommend specifically for African-American context um, in terms of dealing with suffering and God's engagement with our suffering? Oh, that's a great question, brother. That's a great question. Um, okay, so I mean, I would say, uh, you know, uh, so so the the black church tradition is filled with theodical resources, okay, mm. because it is a tradition that has been forged in the crucible of oppression and suffering, okay. And so um, I would, you know, I would tell folks uh, to look to the kind, you know, look look to uh, the kinds of historic resources that you might not necessarily think of as formal theological resources. Read, get yourself a book of spirituals, and read through them, and 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 imbibe the deep theology that you find there. Right? Um, you know, uh, uh, you know, you know, you know, sing songs like, you know, didn't my Lord deliver Daniel? Did my Lord deliver Daniel? Did my Lord deliver Daniel? And why not every man? That's a deep wrestle. That's a deep struggle. Uh, the, the, the idea that, man, uh, you know, God delivered Daniel. God delivered the Hebrew boys. But I'm in this situation right now and I'm struggling and uh, and I don't find myself delivered in the same way. Right. That's a that's a that's a theodical struggle. And so I would say, you know, uh, get a book of, uh, of, of of spirituals, read through them. Um, uh, and, uh, and, you know, uh, you know, things written by, you know, Dr. King, I mean, this, this theme is, is constant throughout his works. 
Uh, you can get uh, the, the King Papers Project uh, from Stanford is, is a great resource. Um, the central for those of us who are on a budget and need to get like, you know, like to get sort of the um, uh, the executive summary of King's works. Mm -hmm. uh, the Central Writings of Dr. King, the, the Central Writings of Martin Luther King Jr. That's a much more affordable resource that you can um, that you can acquire. Uh, uh, you know, get get Dr. Penn's book. Why, Lord? You know, um, even though he's offering a um, he's offering a kind of a response, a, a kind of a, a refutation of redemptive suffering theologies, he does a good job of chronicling them. Mm -hmm. And so you can get a sense of what has been said throughout the tradition. Um, uh, Howard Thurman is another wonderful resource. Um, uh, and uh, and so, yeah, uh, you know, so so these are some great resources that you can kind of, you know, connect into in order to try to get a better sense of of these kinds of uh, this kind of thing. And, and, you know, I don't want, I want to be too, you know, sort of self promoting here. But uh, but my book, The Power of Unearned Suffering, I hope is also uh, a resource that really helps to examine uh, the historic uh, kind of um, uh, kind of um, narrative and kind of uh, chronicles different examples of the redemptive suffering theodicies and the influences that impact the king's life particularly, and also the kind of modern and contemporary appropriation of, of, of redemptive suffering theodicy. So you can get my book as well. Um, if you cannot afford my book, it's a little on the expensive side. Uh, I, I can hardly afford my book. You know, I don't set these prices. You know, we, I, I didn't set the price. OK, OK. Uh, but you can get your, your local library to order it. And then uh, and if they order it, then it's, you know, everybody can have access to it. Nice. That's awesome. How can uh, people uh, stay in contact with you or uh, propose more questions? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, um, yeah. Uh, you can look me up on Facebook uh, or, or Twitter, you know, Micah Edmondson. Uh, and just type in my name and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of easy to find there. Uh, you can uh, also, you can go to our church's website. Uh, our church is a uh, new city fellowship. We're in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, it's a new city church. Uh, uh, at, uh, what is it? New city, new city, GR at, uh, new city, GR dot org. That's what it is. New city, GR dot org, www.newcitygr org. So that's our, that's our church's website. And uh, and yeah, so, you know, just I, that's how you can connect with me. Awesome. Hey, brother, I want to appreciate you for uh, sharing all of that wisdom and insight. I know people are going to profit uh, from this. Um, hope that you continue to stay engaged because you're such a great voice to have as we defend the faith um, that's been once and delivered all to, to all the saints. And just want to thank you for being with us. Um, to our viewers, uh, thank you for engaging with us. Uh, stay tuned for another great um, podcast as we continue to defend the faith, um, helping believers know what they believe and why they believe it. Until next time, you guys have a great uh, MLK weekend and celebrate by seeing how the gospel uh, empowers us to fight racial um, um, uh, fight uh, racial uh, injustices and systemic oppression. Thanks, guys.